now more than ever, people need to go within and plug into that cellular memory, plug into the divine source, detach as much as possible from the matrix. Hello again, everybody. This is James Bartley, and you're listening to the Cosmic Switchboard Show. Today, our very special guest is Liz the Magellan. Liz is a dear friend. She's been on the show before to talk about some of her experiences. Today, she's going to be talking about the alien love bite and how she experienced it, how it affected her, and how what she had gone through and endured during childhood, in a way, set the stage, created a template, if you will, which made it easier for this love bite drama later down the track to take hold. And this is the third time we've been trying to get this interview in because we're getting all kinds of weird interference. So without any further ado, Liz, the Magellan, welcome back to the Cosmic Switchboard Show. Thank you for having me. And third time's a charm. Third time's a charm. Well, for the benefit of our listeners, Liz, many of them are already familiar with the concept of the alien love by what Barbara Barthlow referred to as the drama of the love obsession. But you've been able to pinpoint in your own personal experience what you had gone through during childhood in a way had set the stage for what what came later. Did you want to elaborate? Sure. First of all, what I've noticed is that the new age teaches people to not look at the past because it's over, which is a problem because the past still runs the present and the future when it's left unchecked and unhealed. So parts of the situation I experienced in this love bite relationship were related to the initial abuse that I experienced at the age of three, which I spoke about in our last conversation. And during that incident, I learned at one point that I just needed to surrender. There were two perpetrators holding me down, and I fought as hard as I could, but being so small against two near adults, I, I just had to surrender, and I became the victim in that moment. And so, for the, ne- uh, the next several decades of my life, this role as a victim continued to play out in my life in different ways. It would manifest in, in different ways. How were the first manifestations, looking back with the benefit of, of hindsight, how did they play themselves out? You having gone through this childhood abuse and, and the different ways in which they manifested, it's also insofar as your interpersonal relationships, not just intimate relationships, but interacting with others on a daily basis. Because I know that sometimes people that have endured uh, abuse as a child, they develop trust issues, not only with others, but uh, with themselves and trusting their own intuition. Yes, that's exactly it. I learned to become quite people-pleasing. So I, I was always kind to others, even if they may have had more nefarious intentions, and I could sense that. An example that I can think of that happened later in my life is I was almost raped by somebody who was a dear friend of mine. And while I found myself in that moment, part of me was screaming out in my head, kick him where it hurts, you know, hurt him. But then this other part of me was saying, he's your friend. Maybe he doesn't mean it. And I had this inner battle where I dealt with that during that situation. So that's an example of how it can grow into your life where you don't even know your own power. You just basically, like I said, become the victim. Over time, with this victim mentality, whether it was conscious or it was subconscious, when you were getting involved with people, as far as uh, intimate relationships were concerned, was there a pattern of the type of individuals you would get involved with, or do they vary? And were the, some of these same dynamics playing themselves out in, in these different relationships? Uh, physically, the people would vary, but there did seem to be a consistent theme of abusiveness throughout the relationships. There would be a lot of fighting um, degrading talk towards me, me believing it, feeling desperate. Um, my 
MO at the time was I was a runner, so I would just take off and, you know, try to get out of the situation, but I probably wouldn't have left if I wasn't that angry. So there was a bunch of different forces battling each other there. Did you notice anything in the background of some of these individuals that, that you uh, had these interactions with? Any of them go through childhood abuse or go through the abuse of narcissistic parents or narcissistic elders in their lives? That's a good question. The The person that I was in the love bite situation with, I would say absolutely went through those things. Since you brought them up, would you like to tell our listeners how that whole scenario came into being, how you first met him and uh, the circumstances, which later it took these dark twists and turns and you were actually able to survive a, a, you know, a very dangerous situation with this individual. But, but you know, that's further down the story. I think you want to talk about how you first met this guy and how that all came into being. Sure. I was in my first year of college and working at one of the first jobs I had. And it was about June of 2001 when he started working at the same place that I was working. And we began a relationship This was slightly before I moved to university, and it seemed at that time a series of really unfortunate events were occurring in my life that weren't necessarily related to him, but it was an attack of sorts that took down my foundation so that I was left blind and stumbling around and looking for somebody to be there for me. And I, I basically fell into the arms of a predator. You'd mentioned some of these things and they were quite traumatic in many ways. You know, the passing of, of people that you loved and cared about and these other d- dynamics and, and deep personal loss that you endured almost mm-hmm. in a way kind of set a template for what came down the track. It did. He walked into my life and A beloved cat passed away at the age of four years old. And then within several months, and I'd say probably just about two, we discovered my dad had been having an affair. And he wasn't like that as far as I knew growing up. So at that point, my dad ended up moving across the country for somebody that he had met and and left us and my family. And then a couple months after that, my grandma died. And then a few months later, after my grandpa had stepped in and been the father figure for me, he passed away. And during all this time, I had moved away to university. And it was just a stream of events that was very emotionally rocking. And then you throw in this this kind of relationship with somebody who was not well and that really changed my life what was it about this individual aside from the close proximity of having to work with him and interact with him on on a somewhat regular basis did he reach out to you what was about what was it about him that kind of drew you in Uh, was there something about his personality his demeanor his physical appearance uh, energetically What do you think was the reason for the initial attraction? That's something I've never completely understood because people in my life had noticed that he had a very strong body odor Mm. and they were repulsed by it. And I noticed it, but I looked past it. He was a decent looking guy, but... I mean, he was kind of, I I believe at some point he was missing some teeth. Mm -hmm. He had poor hygiene. He was not my type of person, but I was attracted to him. And it could have been the personality thing, or maybe because I had been raised so conservatively and good and he was the bad boy. I'm not sure about that, but it was like some sort of vortex drew me into this relationship. And despite my intuition, I was unable to get out of it. And I even began defending him. 
take us through the early stages of this relationship with him. Some people talk about, even though the individual that they were set up in this love by with may have rather odious characteristics, and you just mentioned some, he had poor physical hygiene and he had a body odor, and there were other aspects that you described about him and his mendacity, for example. He lied a lot. He was very demeaning and very insulting towards you. Did he start off nice with you initially, and then did you move in with each other, or did you kind of date each other for a while? And how did his demeanor, his personality, change to, towards you over time? He was very nice in the beginning, and that's how he lured me in. He had a very difficult upbringing and a questionable past. Uh, there were seven siblings in his family, and all of them had been through the child welfare system. They all needed to survive and learned exactly what to do to do that. And he used to tell me stories about his mom having parties, and when the people would pass out, she'd wake up the kids and have them go steal money out of the people who were passed out's pockets. <laughs> Wow. Like they were, they were raised from an early age to take what they needed to. So, and he had spent time in juvie and in adult jail. So that was something I wasn't accustomed to because like I said before, in our other conversation, I came from a pretty, what appeared to be a pretty clean and put together home. So that was very different. And then I had learned over, well, pretty soon after meeting him that he had been charged with sexual interference on a minor. But he convinced me that basically he had just spanked his younger brother when he was babysitting him and that the criminal justice system misinterpreted it. And you know what? Let me just go back for a second and say, at this time, I was 19 years old. I was just starting out a life of my own. And I really, I was naive and plain out stupid. I thought everybody was like me. I thought people were actually nice. I knew that there were murderers out there and whatnot, but I thought that they just needed love and they didn't get it as kids. And I had all that wishy-washy mentality that... People weren't really bad, but I learned that I was completely wrong about that. There are bad people out there, and it's okay to say that. Do you feel there was an, an aspect within you that you felt you could reform him or you could change him for the better or save him from himself kind of thing? Absolutely. I used to look at him when he was sleeping and think like this poor human being, I can't believe he went through what he went through. How could anyone treat him the way he was treated? Because like I said, he had a not very nice upbringing. He had been physically and sexually abused and had had different things happen to him. So my heart just ached that somebody could go through that. But that's where choice comes in. Yeah. We all have choices. Did he go through a foster care system? Yes, he did. And just even in his own home life, there was stories between the siblings of incest amongst them that they'd watch the, each other and whatnot. So it was completely different from anything I'd ever experienced or heard about in my life. You've set the stage for the dynamic that's to come because you're vulnerable you're somewhat naive at the time, and this happens to a lot of people. This is why so many people, Liz, can't see these agendas playing out right in front of them because, right. first of all, it's not something that they would do, all these crimes at a very high level, let alone the fact that most of them don't have the means and the protection to carry out these crimes. So they don't think like felonious-type criminals at a high level. So you had that as a handicap where – you felt that everyone just needed love and, you know, TLC and, and understanding. One thing about these narcissists is, is their ability to zero in on those who are vulnerable and those who have this 
kind of background like like yours, like a wounded um, inner child. How long into the relationship did it take for him to start? You know, you mentioned he started out being nice to you. How long were it started to take a dark turn where he began to treat you differently? And, and how did he behave to your friends? How did your friends perceive him also? It probably took maybe a couple months to take a, a dark turn. And my friends didn't respond well to him. In fact, I lost a number of friends being in a relationship with him. And I used to get rides home because when I moved to university, I lived six hours away from my hometown. So I used to catch a ride back to my hometown with a friend of mine and she refused to transport him because <laughs> this is really embarrassing, but he made her vehicle smell so bad that she said, like, I will not have him in it again. Wow. Yeah, and that just came to me. It, it's like I'm kind of chuckling about it now because it's unbelievable how everyone knew around me and I was just, my head was in the clouds. Just talking about the body order. It's interesting because there's a metaphor behind it, too. He was physically repellent to other people, but to, to yourself, you kind of, uh, in a way, overcompensated. You overlooked this particular malodorous aspect of him, but it still repelled and, and bothered other people, and that, that yeah. created issues with some of your friends, like you just pointed out. Exactly. And then... We did end up moving in together. He followed me to university. He was a professional freeloader, mm -hmm. so he needed a place to stay, and I was more than happy to allow him to do that. And I just noticed my confidence slowly decreasing, and I started to believe what he said about me. Like He would tell me I was fat, and I wasn't. Looking back at those pictures, I w that was probably the thinnest I ever was because I was so stressed out. And he'd do things like tell me who he thought was attractive on TV. And then they would be someone who was the complete opposite of what I was. So I never felt like I could measure up. Or he'd laugh at how stupid he perceived I was. But he did have a low IQ and had taken classes in our high school that were designed for people who weren't how do i say that correctly who weren't as smart as everyone else yeah kind of like regarded as being uh, requiring extra attention let's say yes during this process you start to be insulting towards you what was he like physically towards you? Was he ever threatening? Was As far as intimacy is concerned in the early days and then when things started to take a darker turn, did you see a change in his behavior in that regard? Yes. Physically, and this developed over a year and a half. We were in a relationship for only a year and a half, but it felt like a decade. He used to take a butcher knife out of the kitchen and he'd hold it at me and come running at me with the knife straight out. And at the last minute, he'd turn it. Oh, and then wow. he'd laugh really hard because I was scared shitless. I mean, yeah. someone's running at me with a knife. That's not okay. And so that was one of his fun things he liked to do with me. And then sexually... I'd say things were very normal in the beginning. And over time, he wanted to enact uh, rape fantasies he had, which in involved strangulation and basically me pretending to not want to be intimate and him doing what he wanted to enact out as a rape. And I knew it was wrong and creepy but i did it he was very reptilian like uh, one of the uh, the predators and there was definitely a, you know with the benefit of hindsight and a lot of the research i know like myself uh, liz you've studied the minds of, of serial killers and you've studied serial killers so 
you know, nowadays with the benefit of hindsight, we can look back and say, oh yeah, this guy definitely manifested some reppy type behavior. Totally. Uh, and one aspect of the reppy type behavior is this concept of human ownership where they think they feel they own you and they feel that they can in a way become another person's God, uh, uplift them, tear them down, belittle them, uh, derive a, a sadistic pleasure in making the other person feel poorly psychologically and, and physically. You know, take us through the process of what it was like being involved with, with a narcissist uh, at that level, a very reptilian-like narcissist. It was horrible. The existing mental health conditions I had at that time, they got worse. I began to get more... OCD or obsessive compulsive because I needed to control whatever I could. And I would constantly scrub my floors. <laughs> I think it must have been a metaphor because they, I could never get them clean enough. Yeah. But that was something I fixated on. And when I spoke about cutting my wrists, that was in our last chat there was a time period where he'd really goad me on to do that. And I would be so desperate. I would go and lock myself in the bathroom and start cutting. And he'd be on the other side of the door screaming at me to kill myself and just do it already. Like nobody cares. And I'd be back there crying and, you know, tr attempt trying to kill myself, but I couldn't even succeed at that. You know, like, I ba he basically helped me see how I was a failure on so many levels. And I allowed him to do that. I do have to take accountability. It's classic mind control. In a way, a more extreme form of, of military boot camp where these people come in from the outside, their, their heads are shaved, their outside civilian identities are stripped until there's a blank slate and then they just program all these ideologies, creeds, and dogmas into the into the recruit until they become an obedient uh, weapon of war. And in this case, it sounds like he was breaking you down. You, were, you already had this inherent vulnerability from what had happened in the past. And you, you mentioned in, in the previous interview with us that you'd gone through this phase of, of having to overcome pharmaceutical addiction and dealing with the pharmaceutical tyranny. So... On top of all that, this narcissistic reptilian freeloader comes into your life. And can you give our listeners an idea of what it's like having to support a freeloader who at the same time is not only freeloading off you, but playing with your emotions, manipulating you, making you feel poorly about yourself? It was utterly exhausting. For my physical body, I lost so much weight. I couldn't afford to keep up with everything. I was going to school full-time and working full-time. And at the same time, he was stealing my money and my things. So I, I had nothing. I, there was a time where I lived off of rice, rice and hot chocolate mix for probably like three or four months. Wow. And I worked at a mall and I ended up even taking toilet paper from there because I, I couldn't afford to buy my own. So I engaged in, in stealing, I guess. you That's what it was. But I, I was desperate. I, I didn't have anything. And he just, he never gave anything back. He would, he would get a job and... I would get gifts, and then it, in the end, it turned out that the gifts belonged to somebody else that he was cheating on me with, and he was giving my stuff to her. So everything in this relationship was extremely discombobulating. I'd think I had my head up on right, and you know, I was standing the right way on the ground, and the next thing I knew, he'd pull out the ground from under me, and I'd be metaphorically hanging upside down and completely confused it was utterly nonsense take us back to some of the the rape fantasies that the, he indulged in and because 
he exerted this kind of mind control on you. I think he indicated earlier that you kind of acquiesced and, and you played the victim in, in these fantasies and, and that kind of turned him on. And what other kind of, you know, reptilian like fetishes was he into? Was he into like, like cross dressing or dressing up or yes. uh, state of mass? Yes. Anything? One time I came home from being in my hometown and he was in my clothes. Oh, wow. And I, I, I laughed because I wasn't used to seeing anything like that. Not only was he in my clothes, he had taken my curling iron and curled his hair in ringlets. Oh, wow. Because he wanted to look like he had hockey hair. Like he played on a hockey team, yet he was dressed up in my clothes. And I laughed and I said, like, did you go out in that and he said yes very honestly and i couldn't believe it because here he had this fake hockey hair and a woman's sweater on and my pants and i think he might have even had eyeliner on and out he went and i'm not knocking people who like to dress in other clothing that's fine but this just shocked me because he he was a different kind of guy. It's not an unusual uh, facet of, of people that have these reptilian tendencies. I mean, it's even played out in that classic movie, the Silence of the Lambs, where the, the serial murderer would make himself appear to be a woman. He would stand in front of the full-length mirror nude, and he would hide his male genitalia so he at least could play this fantasy out like he was really a woman, right? So, you know, and I, I bring this up because, and thank you for sharing that, Liz, because it, it's part and parcel of what these reptilian hybrid hardcore uh, perp types are all about. First of all, he's freeloading off you and just sucking your, your, your resources dry to the point where you have to steal toilet paper and, and live off rice and, and, and chocolate mix. Secondly, he's stealing from you and giving your gifts away to others that he's cheating with. And then there's this dynamic where he has this uh, reptilian violent fantasy thing going on where he, in order to make himself turned on and excited, he has to feel like he's raping you and that he's acquiescing. On top of that is the cross-dressing aspect. And, and I've, I've said this before, but Back in the day when they used to show, I don't know if they show them now, but they used to always show court TV in the old days, right? There was like one or two channels. And I remember changing the channel, channel surfing one time, and I stopped at the court TV uh, channel, and there was a guy that was basically under interrogation. He was going under cross-questioning. And I took one look at him, and intuitively I blurted out loud, he's a cross-dresser and he murdered his wife. And he's a sadistic, uh, he's a sadistic psychopath reptile. And sure enough, within just a few minutes of, of watching this, it came out in the testimony and it came out in the courtroom that that's exactly what he was into. He was in a cross dressing. He was into uh, abusing and torturing his partner, which turned out to be this woman, his wife that he murdered. And so, the point, you know, the point of relevance is it, it's part and parcel of this whole reptilian aspect. And, and, and again, here's a disclaimer. We're not getting down on people who like to cross-dress for whatever reason. We're talking about a, a particular percentage, a particular demographic within that culture, within that culture of people who like to do this, that are sadistic and, and are, are into all that. Now, what other aspects, if you don't mind sharing? I mean, was he into, was he into anal sex? Was he into because that that factored into your story later on, and, and, and take us to that uh, through that process because things got really toxic, things got really dark, things got really scary. Where after a while, you were asking your friends to, you know, check up on you, and uh, because again, that isolation, you were six hours from home, freeloader, psychopath is living with you. You're living hand to mouth because he's stealing up all your resources. Uh, take us through that process, Liz. Well, if I go back to the the strange sexual things, he was more into anal sex for himself, not necessarily with me. 
Mm -hmm. But having been in and out of the prison system, he had experienced anal sex being in there. Mm -hmm. So that was something that he craved that I could not provide for him. Did he want you to, like, what some of them do is they're in the, because unless they have a willing partner that wants to do that to them, and sorry for being kind of graphic, it's part and parcel of this whole dynamic we're talking about. Was he suggesting to you that you use foreign objects on him or, or, or things along that line? Or did he have to watch violent videos or something to turn himself on? Or uh, how did that play out? No, he never asked me to do that. And as far as I know, he wasn't watching violent videos. But I did find a lot of pictures of younger looking women in the stuffle bag that he always kept packed in my home. And when I would go to school or whatnot, he would be on the webcam talking to other people. So I really don't know what he was doing when I was gone, but I did find evidence of a lot of pictures of what appeared to be younger women throughout my my home and in his duffel bag. I started to snoop because something didn't feel right. You were like 19, 20 years old around mm-hmm. the time. So yeah. when you say younger, you're, you're implying perhaps 15, 16, 17, 18 years old. Could be, yeah. yeah. I can't say for sure, but that definitely could be possible. Keep in mind the whole charge with sexual interference on a minor. On a minor, yeah. And... That always sat a little weird with me. He did have not just that odor of B.O., but there was this kind of, how do I explain it? As someone who's been abused, there's kind of this smell I I get. And it might just be, a it may be, around people who are pedophiles. Uh Like I can almost just, even if they're on TV, I get this sense in my nasal cavity. That's, that's a pervert or or that's a pedophile. So he had that, that smell to me and I can't, I can't describe it adequately. Was it kind of a musky kind of smell? Uh, You know, kind of underneath. It's kind of a sweet, like urine smell. Oh, really? Yeah. Like a almost like a cat or a dog urine kind of smell. or Yeah, something like that. Yeah. The process of these perps and these narcissists, well, when they break down the individual's persona, turn it into a blank slate, and then reconfigure it, so to speak, to the point where the person begins to believe all the psychological abuse, you're worthless, you're dumb, you're fat, everything else, you just talked about a key point where I've heard this from, from other women when they talk about a love bite dynamic uh, where they'll say that, I don't know what attracted me to this guy, but, but there was something about him energetically that sometimes it, it could be the smell, the pheromone, something along those lines. But sometimes they talk about this, this energetic pool that this reppy kind of person uh, manifests where it seems to, hook into energetically to the the person that they're trying to victimize. Did did you feel any kind of a weird energetic pull or vortex from him? I definitely did. I think that's what sucked me in. Almost liken it to entity attachments. Yes. Now, now with the benefit of hindsight. Yeah. Because did it have a way of kind of swamping your, your, your consciousness, swamping your good sense where you just kind of left, left you in a fugue state. Absolutely. If if I encountered somebody like him today, I would walk away. <laughs> like, it's that simple. But with this, I was just, oh, like, I had hearts in my eyes, and <laughs> I couldn't see past anything. Now, how long did he live with you? And tell us about some of the other things, that, that, that because it sounds like such a toxic, dysfunctional, discombobulated relationship it must have been high anxiety and high drama for you almost every day because there would be no relief you would go to school you would go home 
and then you would come back to him. And it, you know, yeah, they take us through that. It was really just a terrible time in my life. There was always drama in his life. He was always the victim, and he was always really good at blaming other people. He always engaged in crimes of opportunity. And so I began to start to think like him too. Like if he stole something from somebody, he'd say, well, they shouldn't have left it out. (laughs) That's their fault. So I kind of started living that way in some ways. I wasn't stealing a whole heck of a lot other than toilet paper. But I did start to look things differently. And even personality wise, I like I started to drink a lot and I never did before. I engaged in smoking a lot of marijuana and cigarettes and I wasn't I didn't smoke a lot of marijuana before. I was a smoker at the time. But it seemed like all those things just kept increasing in my life as a way for me to cope. And also then you know the whole entity attachment to those things and how that draws you in so yeah. i was i feel i was being attacked on several levels there and because he never had any money of his own that also became an issue too where he would steal your weed he would steal your booze he would steal your money he would yeah. steal your jewelry and give it to others yeah and then he took my bank card one day and went to make a deposit into an ATM machine and deposited a receipt and withdrew several hundred dollars that I didn't even have. So I get the bank calling me and they're angry that I had done that. And I said, well, it wasn't me. I absolutely wouldn't do that. I didn't even know you could do that. I thought you had to put money in the machine. And they had to go and review the videos to make sure it wasn't me. And you, you mean he pulled out money from your account that wasn't yep. there? How the yeah. How did that happen? He was smart enough to know that you could make a deposit, and as long as you put anything in the deposit envelope, you can get money out, apparently. Oh, wow. So that bank dropped me after that, and I don't blame them. And, of course, you know, I gave them my PIN, which you're not supposed to do. Yeah. But again, 19, dumb, naive. I had no clue. Now I'm I'm more secure about things. When did it dawn on you that for for your safety, well-being and in order to have any kind of a future, you had to dump this chump? When did you cross that Rubicon, so to speak, that line in your mind, in your heart where enough is enough. I I can't go on this way. How, how did that play itself out? The violent outburst just kept increasing, and I I knew, I kind of just felt this guy is going to kill me. If I don't get out, I'm dead. And so I wrote in a journal, if he kills me, or if something suspicious happens to me, look to, and then I listed his full name. And I contacted my sister and other people who I was close to and said, it's in this journal, it's hidden here. If I die, you know, find that. I've written down everything that's been going on. Find it. Did you decide to just, like, lock him out one day when he was out of the house? Or how did yeah. you expect to break up with him? Well, because he had been through the criminal justice system his entire life, he was big on having evidence. So I had gone out of town, back to my hometown, came back to my place which he was staying in while I was gone and I started to notice that things were out of place and one thing that really stuck with me was I found my eyeshadow in the cutlery drawer and other weird things where they shouldn't be there were pictures I had of my friends and I on the walls that were stashed in the laundry hamper and There were wine glasses on the counter with lipstick on it and a shade I didn't wear. He hadn't even bothered to wash them and put it away. Yeah. Like, I mean, if that's not a slap in the face, I don't know what is. Everything else should have been, but it wasn't. So 
I just documented it and I made a list of all the things I found that were out of place because I had been taking a criminology class. So I was getting good at doing my little, um, I guess, investigations of my home and finding what wasn't right. I knew how to feel under my desk to see if he'd stashed any drugs under there. And I was getting good at getting into his mind also. And so I packed up all his stuff after finding all that evidence. And it didn't take long because, like I said, he always had that duffel bag packed, which is different also. But I had my friend drop it off at his workplace and to say that he wasn't to come back to my place. And that was basically it, so I thought. Well, what did he do when he found out that you kicked him out? He turned into a raging lunatic. He phoned me up and he started off with the with being really angry, like, you know, why the F did you drop off my stuff and, and that sort of thing. And then he he would go into Mr. Nice Guy. It was like a Jekyll and Hyde right in front of me. Oh, I'm so sorry. It wasn't what you think it is. I put it there. Blah, blah, blah. All the excuses that don't even make sense. In other words, he was gaslighting you, trying to uh, imply that you were the one that left the, uh, the yes. wine glasses there with a the different lipstick shade and, and all that stuff. Yeah. And I didn't yeah. even drink wine back then. So, yeah. okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I've said before, because I've grown up and I've been around pathological liars that have this reppy streak to them, they have this room, and it comes from being shameless, I think, and being a narcissist and having no impulse control. They have this remarkable facility to uh, verbally morph reality to suit their latest lie. Uh, I, I mean, you can see them do something right in front of you, like, pick something up, put it down, and put it in the wrong place, whatever. And when you call them out of it, well, you just did that. It doesn't make sense. Why did you do that? You're making more work for me. I didn't do that, right? Yeah. Or, or you know, there's countless different examples of, of how they operate where they could just, they lie when they don't have to. Like some of us, who were painted into a corner and, you know, we have to lie or something. It's, yeah. you know, we, 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 we come up with a believable lie. We, we, we kind of, you know, structure in a way where we can make it hold, like a cover story, right? But one of these, uh, well, not one, but some of these types that we're talking about, they don't even take much time to, to fashion a believable lie. They just spew it out there, and it's part of the narcissistic mind control, the Jedi mind tricks they like to play, where they just assume that you go along with it. Exactly. You finally did succeed in getting them out of your house for a while, right? Mm -hmm. And some of your friends were helping you through this process, like walking you home and stuff, because at night you rightfully were concerned for your safety that he could just pop up from behind the tree. He'd already held a knife to you in the past. How did he try to reinsert himself into your life? Uh, because this is where it takes a particularly dark turn. And it's also a part morality play on the one hand, but also psychodrama and also some of your own issues that you hadn't quite worked out, right? Mm -hmm. Which kind of opened the door for him to come back. Can you take us through that process? Cause it's. After I had packed up his bag and had my friend leave it at his work that same night, my friend stayed with me and we had gone to bed and I lived on the ground floor of my apartment building. And so he finished his shift and came and started pounding on the windows and the doors, screaming to let him back in. And this is quite embarrassing because I'm in a large apartment building and everyone can hear him in the stairwell and I have to pretend that I'm not in there, which I obviously am. I don't know. I guess I could have gone and slept somewhere else, but I didn't. And I called up my mom during that incident and kind of like whispered to her, like, he's outside screaming. And she said, he's like a magician and he's trying to pull every trick out of his hat that he can to keep you in this relationship. Don't listen to him. And so I fought and, and did that. But he was screaming outside of my window that he was going to kill me and my family. And that 
That really did scare me. Not so much that he'd kill me, but my family. I wasn't okay with that at all. And at some point, he ended up either tiring himself out. I don't know where he went. But the next morning, I got up to go to school, and he was out there still, wanting to come back in. And so I ended up calling the campus security on him. And that campus is enormous. So the university has their own police force. And they ended up detaining him. And I thought things were good. So I started to walk to my class. But I just happened to run into this guy and these three officers that were escorting him off of the university campus and he lunged at me which was pretty scary and then i went to my class and kind of acted like nothing he, happened but to interject for a second he, he lunged at you in full view of these three cops yeah oh so. yeah like it was really kind of a joke how it was handled because then after the class, my friend walked me back to my room and he wasn't anywhere to be seen. But as soon as she left me, he stepped out from behind a tree. Mm. Of course. I mean, <laughs> if anyone could make themselves look like a tree, he could. And I didn't see him. But of course, there he is. And he came out saying immediately, I know you called the cops on me. And I guess he had asked the officers who had called to have him detained. And they could have said anyone heard him screaming, but they said, it wasn't your ex-girlfriend. Well, they just gave him the answer right yeah, there. Right, so he right, knew yeah. it. So way to go protecting and serving in that situation. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yeah. And then I found at that point it wasn't... It wasn't easy to not cave and let him back in because he was, he was good at twisting things around and you, you know, just telling me that I believe something that was incorrect and he just, he could talk his way out of anything. So I didn't let him back in then and I didn't for several months and then he pulled out the, the trick that he was going to kill himself and it would be my fault. Mm. So he called me and did that for a while, and I don't even remember how he reacted to it. I did feel sad about it if he was going to do that, but somehow I was able to rectify within myself that it wouldn't be my fault if he did. And then over time, it got easier and easier. So this all happened in 2001 to 2003. And around 2007, I thought, Oh, I can I could be friends with him. And he contacted me again. And I was living in a different place with two roommates and they were out of town. And he had nowhere to stay, so it's the same old sob story again. He has nowhere to stay, no food, no money, blah blah blah. And I believed it. And this has been a few years since you'd last seen him since you kicked him out of yeah. your house. He happened to call you just when your roommates were gone. Yeah, and I hadn't had any communication with him, and I didn't advertise when people were going to be out of town on social media or anything like that. So I don't know how he knew, but he knew. I think it implies that he was already, we're still keeping you under surveillance. Like, not as much. Totally. Much it was either like a high consciousness thing where the entity told him, call her now. You know, now's your chance, or he just as nefarious. He was watching and just, you know, studying patterns there, people, the comings and goings of yourself and your roommates. So he, he rolls out the sob story about once again, he's destitute, he's impoverished, he's hungry, he needs a roof over his head. Did, did he imply that he only wanted to stay one night, or did he imply that he wanted to flop and lounge around indefinitely again? He didn't even imply either. I think he knew he could play on my my goodness and I would let him come by. And maybe he knew because I had roommates. It wouldn't fly for him to stay very long. Yeah, yeah. So, so what happened then? This is where it takes a really dark turn, folks. So pay attention. Yeah. 
Well, I let them come into my place and we smoked my weed all evening and relaxed and watched TV and I shared my cigarettes with him and I cooked him supper and it wasn't in a relationship way. I just thought I'm going to give this guy a meal. He's been on the streets for some time. Why not help, help a brother out? And then when it was time for bed, I said, you can go sleep in my roommate's bed and in this room. And he, he went to sleep and I went to sleep and, uh, I had a recently adopted kitty that I brought into my home. And one side of me is I've always been interested in communicating with animals and I felt that I could communicate with them. And so I had been working to telepathically communicate with this cat and that thankfully became part of the incident that followed. And then in the middle of the night, I was sleeping on my stomach and I woke up to find my air supply being cut off. He was on top of me, trying to anally rape me, and his hands were around my throat, strangling me. And I started to lose consciousness. So I communicated telepathically with my cat, like, help, help, help. And I couldn't scream or anything. So thankfully, my cat came into the room, or had already been in the room, I have no idea, and he latched into this guy's Achilles with his teeth and claws and didn't let go until he got off of me. And then I stood up and I screamed at him to get out. And then I locked my cat and I in my bedroom, and somehow I managed to go back to sleep. What did he do? Did he stick around or did he leave? He left, but the next morning I woke up and I went downstairs and I thought like, you know, I need my coffee and my cigarette after that. And I found he had stolen all of my smokes, all of my weed, all of my money when he left the night before. Oh, geez. Same old, same old. Yeah. Which really showed me his character. By their fruits, you shall know them. Yes. And once again, it it speaks to the complete lack of impulse control. Instead of being thankful and feeling gratitude because you gave him a chance, at least for one night, to have shelter and uh, warm food in his belly and party out with him, this is how he repays you because the lack of impulse control, now is my chance to anally rape her and strangle her while I'm at it. That's just pretty hardcore, but but it's destructive and it's, a teaching moment for some women out there that are going through similar things because part of the wounded shame based syndrome is we don't trust ourselves. We don't trust the internal radar system we have. Now, now think about it, folks, uh, the military industrial complex go to all these efforts to, make all these devices, uh, sensors, radars, sonars, spy satellites, acoustic listening devices, everything else you can think of to monitor, to uh, have an early warning system, if you will. But being organic, multidimensional beings, we already have that within us. But because of this process, which Liz has been describing, of this narcissistic reptile perp psychopath, just gradually, incrementally over time, just eroding her self-worth. And remember, she had the unfortunate past of, of having the childhood abuse, so she was already vulnerable to being victimized in this way. And so this perp, over time, eradicates Liz's self-worth and her sense of even danger. And because he had that one moment of, of opportunity, because of their opportunist, he struck And that's what people have to remember about these perps is all they need is a moment to strike because these thoughts, these sadistic fantasies are playing out like a movie in their head over and over and over because the entities working through them make them feel and see these movies, these sadistic movies playing out over and over and over. And, you know, thank goodness that you were able to call upon your cat telepathically and help fight him off, Liz. And I didn't talk to him after that. He 
he did contact me maybe a year or so after, maybe it was even less after that incident and said he didn't even plan on doing that. And he was sorry. <laughs> and he was looking for me to, you know, let him, Oh, that's okay. Sure. You can come do it again. <laughs> but I just, I never responded to him. In the time you got left in this first segment, and I want you to elaborate more in, in the second segment, tell us a process of, of detoxing and healing from this and how it strengthened you over the long haul, over the long term, because you got a crash course in what it's like dealing with these reptilian psychopaths. But to you, it's not a theory. It's not something you read in a profiler book because you lived it. Uh, what were the initial steps you took to, to heal yourself? And I imagine forgiveness to yourself was a part of that process too. Yeah, this has been something that... I mean, even before we started talking today, I had to work on healing even more from it because I was actually quite nervous to talk about it, being as that it was so traumatic. But I learned from this situation that the shadow can manifest what we call good qualities, such as being empathetic of others and whatnot. And that it can translate into sacrificing yourself at the sake of others, not knowing your worthiness, not knowing who you are, and playing the victim. At that time, I thought I deserved to be treated like that, and I believed I was flawed and had a victim sign on my forehead. And when I finally realized I didn't, and it wasn't just after this incident, it took me many years of long, hard work and looking at myself. I was able to change my beliefs about myself and then change my life. And I learned also that just because something bad happens to somebody else, it doesn't mean that you or anyone else is responsible for that except for them. I'm responsible for my actions and there's no reason to allow another human to take advantage of you just because they're damaged. And they say when you're on an airplane that you need to put on your own oxygen mask before you can save others. Yeah. Good and I hadn't done that. I was trying to save him and I hadn't even put on my own mask. So no wonder I almost died in the situation. He lived for destruction. We can't change others. We can only change ourselves. You bring up a good point because one of the aspects of this kind of dynamic is the lack of separation between the, the victim and the perpetrator because things get so enmeshed, you no longer have a will of your own. This perp's whims, their... Uh, behaviors affect you at so many levels, uh, emotionally, physically, spiritually. By the time you got left in this first segment, give us an idea of, of what that lack of separation feels like. Well, what In practice, what it's like to be so enmeshed with somebody that you, you don't even feel comfortable in your own skin because you feel so trapped and connected and ensnared with this other person. It's very confusing, and I'd liken it to if anyone's seen cats fighting and they're just a ball of fur rolling around, that's kind of what it would look like energetically. It felt, or I felt desperate. I hated myself. I was frustrated. I was angry. I felt like I had nowhere to turn. And when I wanted to turn and ask for help, I had... I guess what they call Stockholm Syndrome, I wanted to protect him also. So there was that major contradiction where I wanted out, but then I'm protecting my abuser. It didn't make any sense. In these toxic scenarios and toxic environments, it doesn't make sense from a logical standpoint because it's, it goes against the survival instinct. To, that's like, you know, we don't see this in the wild. That's what's interesting, Liz, where whether it's for, for territorial purposes or, or for whatever reason, 
we don't see animals that are being bullied or abused or chased out of a territory. We don't see them feeling sympathetic, if you will, towards their abuser, whether it's a bigger bird or whatever the case may be. But because of this mind control and this behavior modification that this in, in this psychodrama that you just described, the person loses their own will, they lose their volition, and they become like a lump of clay to, to the perpetrator uh, who can, you know, shape the reality of the other person, gaslight them. I'm, they're rooting the person's life in so many different ways and yet turn it all around and, and make it seem as if the victim is the one that's causing all these problems because one of the aspects of these, these perpetrators is they never own up to their own feelings and they never are accountable. They always make someone else responsible for the feelings. You know, if you didn't roll your eyes and, and sigh when I told you I got fired and lost the job, then I wouldn't have given you a black eye. So it's your fault. If you hadn't, you know, gotten upset because, you know, I, I did all these stupid things that I wouldn't have lashed out at you. It, it's always projecting outwards and making the other person responsible for their own lack of impulse control, basically. So you've taken us through a, uh, a roller coaster ride, Liz, in this first segment. And, and thank you very much for sharing. And this is why, folks, when I need someone to talk to, when I need someone that can help me through whatever challenges or issues I'm going through, I, I love to talk to Liz because she's gone through so much. She's she's walked the walk, she's lived it, she's endured it, and she's we're all a work in progress, but she's really come a long way from having gone through all the stuff that she described. Uh, Liz, can you give our listeners uh, your website again? Sure. It's themagellion.com, T-H-E-M-A-G-E-L-I-O-N.com. And this is James Bartley. You've been listening to our guest, Liz the Magellan. And if you like what we do here at the Cosmic Switchboard Show, if you believe in what we do, please go to thecosmicswitchboard.com, sign up, become a member, and we'll see you at the top of the next segment.